we've got some incredibly interesting and important developments in the bond market. Now, what most people want to know, is the bond market sell-off over with? Are rates going to go lower from here? Are they going to go back higher? What's going to happen? The same uncertainty applies, of course, to Wall Street economists and their central bank counterparts, who are desperately looking for clues about which way the markets are going to head. And they think they've found something, something incredibly important that to them suggests the market is finally getting with the central bank program of higher for longer. This important, crucial signal, at least in their worldview, just flipped from a negative to a positive over the last couple months, and that is at least according to the financial media reporting on it, everything that we should know about the direction of interest rates. What is it I'm talking about? Something that economists call term premiums. And term premiums are nothing more than an error term, a model error, as my friend Rob likes to describe it. However, to central bankers and Wall Street economists, therefore the financial media, a term premium is a substantial economic and financial variable. Financial variable so becomes an economic variable. And therefore you've seen lots of, likely seen, lots of stories floating around financial media about rising term premiums and how this means rates are going up and they're going to stay up. Is that really the case? What are term premiums? What can we make of them? Those are the questions that we're going to answer today because there are massive, substantial developments in the bond markets. They just may not be the ones that are consistent with positive term premiums. Let's start with that, asking that question. What is a term premium? Let's Let's go to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's economists because it has a staff of economists who do these types of things. And that's some of those staffers have developed several models for measuring term premiums or what they claim is a measure of a term premium, assuming that either of those things are actually significant. Here's how they describe a term premium. In standard economic theory, yields on treasury securities are composed of two components expectations of the future path of short-term treasury yields, and the treasury term premium. The term premium is defined as the compensation that investors require for bearing the risk that interest rates may change over the life of the bond. Since the term premium is not directly observable, it must be estimated, most often from financial and macroeconomic variables. So you can already see we're in trouble here because economists and these researchers have to essentially infer term premiums from a whole bunch of information. It's not like they can go right to the marketplace and say, what is the additional compensation you require to hold a 10-year treasury? That's what a term premium is supposed to be. How economists decompose longer-term interest rates is different from how longer-term interest rates actually behave. What they have assumed, because everything has to come back to an economic an econometric variable, they have to be able to put it in a regression equation, they have decided that Irving Fisher's very simple, elegant explanation for bond yields, we can't do that because what Fisher said and what reality shows is that, that long-term bond yields are a combination of growth and inflation expectations. But where do you get growth, growth and inflation expectations? You can't put that into a formula. So what economists have done to try to get around that fact is to distill bond rates into two different components that are supposed to be similar concepts. We don't know what growth and inflation expectations are, but we know what the Federal Reserve thinks they might be. So we're going to model long-term interest rates starting as a function of short-term interest rates. And what are short-term interest rates? Short-term interest rates are the Fed or the ECB, whatever central bank. However, we know that in short-term interest rates don't explain all the behavior in long-term interest rates. So Building upon the work of Ben Bernanke, so that's one reason why term premiums have stuck around as long as they have, even though they send off no more nonsense than anything else in uh, modern central banking. Because Ben Bernanke put this stuff together, term premiums continue to last throughout the, the canon of ec economics as it exists right now. So they start with short-term interest rates and the projection of what they think short-term interest rates will be in the future, and then they add something called a term premium. Now, very simple and intuitive fashion here. Let's think about it like this. If you are going to lend, say, $1,000 to somebody and you were going to lend them $1,000 for the next month, you would expect some interest rate, let's say 5%. So for the next month, I'm going to lend you $1,000 at 5%. But then you come back to me and say, well, I actually need the money for an entire year. To compensate me for lending you for an extra 11 months, 
I'm going to need a higher interest rate. So I'm not going to charge 5% that I was going to charge for you for one month. I'm now going to charge 5% plus a term premium to lend you for a year. And that term premium would increase, uh, presumably, the further out in time we go. So if you want $1,000 for two years, the interest rate's going to go higher. The, 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 you want $1,000 for five years, the interest rate's going to go higher still. This is one way that economists can account for why most yield curves are upward sloping, or they should be upward sloping. So they start with the path of short-term interest rates and they say, well, interest rates are all a function of what the Federal Reserve will offer in the short run because the Fed has alternatives, right? Nowadays, they have the reverse repo and IOR, which they pay out to investors. And so they can influence short-term money rates. And so it stands to reason, as Alan Greenspan was trying to describe in 2005 when he talked about his conundrum, that we would then expect interest rates to build off of that short-term starting point, where the Fed thinks it will have interest rates into the future. And then we just need to add a little bit of a term premium, voila, we've got bond yields. However, as we know, as Alan Greenspan was saying with his conundrum, the very fact it was a conundrum, rates don't seem to work that way. And so we have this major problem where economists are trying to decompose interest rates from the perspective of the Federal Reserve. And so they have the short term, the expected path of short term interest rates as one variable and the term premium as the other variable. But as we've seen over time, it doesn't work that way. Most market practitioners look at these term premiums and just shake their head because first of all, there is no standard way to define it. Again, that's something that has to be inferred from the marketplace using all sorts of econometric and regression type of deconstructions. When the market's much more complicated than that. It's not a simple fact of, it's not a simple decomposition of just these two variables that conveniently fit into econometric models. And I'll give you an example. As I mentioned at the, at the start here, that there are any number of financial media articles recently talking, really talking up the switch in term premiums, which we'll get to in a moment. And what they have to say though, is that even though we economists are talking about term premiums all of a sudden, for many, many years, term premiums confounded them. Because in one part, here's a Bloomberg article, it's the buzzword on Wall Street and in the hallways of the Federal Reserve and Treasury Department. At least that's what the media is trying to sell you on. It's blamed for triggering bond sell-off by economists, shifts in debt auctions and interest rate policy that few agree on what it, exactly what it reflects or how to measure it seems to matter little The term premium is a powerful new force in the market. No, it is not a powerful new force in the market. The financial media is trying to sell you on this term, this term premium that hasn't made sense in years. But now economists are saying that since it's flipped positive, it must be making sense all of a sudden, though they're not gonna like how it's turned out more recently. The problem, going back to the article, is it's not directly observable. Various Wall Street and central bank economists have developed models to estimate it, often with wildly conflicting results. As I said, most market practitioners simply shake their head at the idea of term premiums because they are made up. They aren't real. But because recently term premiums have flipped from negative to positive, economists are trying to sell this idea that this is a meaningful change when, as Rob says, it's nothing more than a model error. Now, why do I call it a model error? Why does Rob call it a model error? And the reason is because term premiums don't reflect anything more than the discrepancy between econometric models and their forecasts and market reality. So again, going back to our simple example, economists say that interest rates should be a combination of the path of short-term interest rates and a term premium. If the Federal Reserve says we're going to set the short-term interest rate at 5% and then leave it there for the foreseeable future, let's assume, say, five years, then that's where every market interest rate is going to build off that, right? That's the assumption that we're making. The Fed is going to keep interest rates at 5%. Any rate that goes out into the future is going to have to be 5% plus some additional premium to compensate the lender for lending for a longer period of time. So the Fed's gonna hold interest rates at 5%, then the five-year rate should be 5% plus some premium, some risk premium. Now that risk premium could expand and contract based on perceptions of risk during that five-year period, but you would never expect a term premium or this risk premium to be negative, would you? 
Because if the Fed says we're going to hold interest rates at 5% and the five-year treasury is yielding 4.5%, then you would say the term premium is negative 50 basis points. How does that make any sense? What it's really saying, as Rob continues to point out, is that your, your model is wrong. Maybe the Federal Reserve thinks it's going to hold rates at 5%, but the market doesn't. And what the market is saying is that growth and inflation expectations that we're pricing are different from what the Federal Reserve's policies are. But economists always start from the Federal Reserve and work backwards, thus the model error. So a negative term premium, really a low positive term premium, is simply them, their models telling them they have the model assumptions all wrong. The market is not conforming to what they're expecting, which isn't, shouldn't be a surprise. And so we go back into the FRBNY data, the, the numbers that they put together on the history of term premiums. They can go back, I think, to the 1960s here. But what you see over the last decade plus is this, ter- this model error telling economists their, their models of interest rates are wrong. Now, what you see is that, first of all, the term premiums tend to rise and fall, or in this case, become positive or more negative whenever we encounter monetary and economic uncertainty, which makes sense because the Fed never sees economic uncertainty as anything. And when we get when, you, when we get into periods where economic growth becomes questionable, we might even encounter recessions, or we see monetary breakdowns and collateral, what happens to interest rates? They tend to fall. Even if the Fed says, we're, we're don't, we don't see the same thing, we think interest rates are going are gonna to stay where they are, but market interest rates fall, and in this construction or deconstruction of, of interest rates, that means the term premium becomes low or negative. Because they think the Fed is God, and the Fed continues to hold rates here, but market rates are below the Fed, that's a negative term premium. And so that's what you see in this, in the, in the, that's what you see in the historical data put together by FRBNY. Going back to 2011 and 2012 when it really started, which we know as euro dollar number two, we see their models of term premiums suddenly plummet because market interest rates, bond yields, crashed in the middle of 2011. But central bankers were not expecting that. They thought their level of interest rates, the, the forward path of short-term rates would be set by the Federal Reserve, when instead the market was saying, we see lower growth and inflation expectations moving forward. Long-term interest rates fell to reflect that, not Fed policy. It was a disagreement between the market and the Fed. Therefore, the negative, the low term premium at that time was a model error. And it got worse. Fast forward to 2014, suddenly term premiums start to fall again. And by 2015, they're actually negative in a couple of these calculations, which again, doesn't make much sense or shouldn't make much sense. And they continue to get more negative as euro dollar number three developed and the market, market demand for safe and liquid instruments drove interest rates down independent of the Federal Reserve's path or the Federal Reserve's forecasted path for short-term interest rates. Again, it's a model error. The Fed thought interest rates were going to do this, but interest rates instead did this, negative term premium. And the negative term premium stuck around pretty much from there on. Now, it did stabilize in 2017 consistent with the idea of globally synchronized growth, which meant that not a recovery, but at least the absence of further problems in the monetary system and the economy up until, as I talked about yesterday, the middle part of 2018. Suddenly, term premiums start to go even more negative because the Fed, remember, was raising interest rates and interest rates were not raising as much as the Fed was because the yield curve was flattening out. The market's saying the Fed's idea of the path of short-term interest rates is not consistent with the market's idea of growth and inflation potential, which was falling off at that time. And by the time we get to 2019, the Fed had rates up here thinking the rates are going to go higher and yields had already fallen pretty dramatically, which meant that in these models, term premiums were even more negative. And they were even more negative because the forecasted path of short-term rates was all wrong. Growth and inflation expectations proved to be correct. So you can see why economists would say, okay, we don't, we don't really understand what's going on with these negative term premiums, but, but 
If term premiums ever flip from deeply negative to positive, that must be something significant. That must mean that this model error that we keep picking up, these negative term premiums that don't make any intuitive sense, that must mean the market is finally getting with the central bank program. That's what we see over the last couple of years, ever since the 2020 breakdown. Essentially, term premiums, they stayed negative, low-level negative throughout 2021 into 2022. As the Federal Reserve was raising rates, we know the bond market was resisting those rates because of the inversions that sprung up. In many ways, term premium is a way of saying inversion, but essentially it's a fancy way of saying it in the econometric model sort of way. So term premiums were negative pretty much throughout the Fed rate hike era because inversions were essentially. But up until August and September of this year, suddenly term premiums started to become less negative. And in late September, according to these models that I'm showing you here, term premiums flipped to positive. Economists want to make a huge deal out of the fact that the 10-year term premium turned positive. This must be earth-shattering. Higher for longer. The market is now saying the Fed is right about its path of short-term interest rates, and now it's adding a positive term premium on top, so higher for longer. That's what they're trying to say. Except only the 10-year really turned positive. The other maturities never really did. And more concerning, at least for their viewpoint, term premiums have rolled over and headed back lower with nominal yields that are again diverging from the Fed's preferred path or the ECB's preferred path. Term premiums, the 10-year term premium is almost back to zero again. So if there was a positive term premium signal, it seems to be dissipating because the market is not what they think it is. It's not the expected short-term path of interest rates that's plotted out in the dots by the Federal Reserve. And we see this in any number of ways, including, as I've talked about many times, forward interest rates and forward interest rate markets. I mean, think about this in the context of European bond yields, which we talk about all the time because European bond yields tend to be a good leading indicator for where we see treasuries go. And European bond yields since the early part of October, while economists here are getting all hot and bothered about positive term premiums in the 10-year in the U.S. Treasury, German rates were already going lower. French rates, Dutch rates were already going lower. And what must those term premiums be given how low those rates are compared to where the ECB rates are today and where the ECB thinks rates are going to be in the future? It's all just model error. So the Fed and the economists and Wall Street people, they can all say, we're going to ignore, for the example, the fact that your RIBOR is increasingly more inverted, which is a forward rate indication. We're going to ignore that. We're going to say the ECB's path of short-term rates or the Fed's path of short-term interest rates, those are infallible. All it tells you, all the positive term premium told you over September into October was that rates were rising. Economists and policymakers are simply trying to make more out of the fact that interest rates were rising in September than they would otherwise be able. They're trying to put some, attach some significance to it through this mathematical calculation that market practitioners know is complete nonsense, simple astrology, nothing better than that. Term premiums are a made-up concepts so that economists can try to model interest rates in their, in their econometric models. And now that term premiums and interest rates themselves are going lower again, not higher, I bet you we're probably not going to hear much about them in the near-term future. I have talked about these cycles before, Euro dollar two, Euro dollar three. What does that refer to? Check out the video link below me. Thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Euro dollar university subscribers, and of course, our Euro dollar university members, some of whom you see here. And until next time, take care.